The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Pow! What's up, guys? Well, another day. We got Tommy Dates here tonight. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. And uh, so tonight we got, we're going to be talking about Jerry Papa and John Papa. Now, Jerry Papa was a wise guy in the Genovese crew. And he was a mad hatter, this guy. This guy was vicious. Uh, he dealt with a lot of narcotics. And anyone who dealt with him, basically, he killed them. I mean, that's the type of guy he was. He did a lot of coke, very paranoid. And eventually, he killed two made guys. And uh, later on, he would uh, get killed because of that. And his son, John Papa, wanted to follow in his footsteps. He wanted to become a made guy, which he never became. And uh, he killed about five of his friends. And he was on a hit where he killed Joe Scopo. Joe Scopo was a Colombo underboss. And John Papa was on that hit. But Tommy Dades is going to tell us a lot about this. He actually arrested uh, John Papa. So he's very knowledgeable with all this stuff. And uh, so he'll be in soon. And once he's in, I'll let him in uh, the studio and we'll chop it up with him. But let me give a couple of shout outs to you guys. I see Boston J. What's up, Boston J? And uh, Princess Mitch, thanks for coming here. I appreciate Jaitano, Brocco. I see you. Uncle Jer, Jujitsu. There you go. And uh, Ben Abahard, Live and Let Live, New York Dad. What's up, New York Dad? New York Dad, I want those sneakers. And I appreciate all you guys showing up today. You know, I, I really do. And, uh, you know, look, there's so much going on. I just got off a Fat Ball Sicilian show. You know, I went on there for 10 minutes. I got this uh, this guy who calls himself MRE. And he's smearing my name. These guys love my name in their mouth. They're trying to make me look bad. Now, look, this is no secret, okay? I testified against Anthony Sparrow. I wasn't no big witness. I was a small timer. You know, my thing back in the day was I used to love to rob and steal. You know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, glorify it. It's who I was at one time. And, uh, you know, I was involved in a mess with my friends, Uh you know, I was involved in a couple homicides, uh, as you know, with Tommy Reynolds. We went to go rob a house, and Tommy Reynolds pulls the trigger on the woman by accident. We never got in the house, and I feel bad for that woman's family. I do. And, you know, I'm ashamed of all that shit. That's the reason why I came forward. Now, but these guys, all they want to do is talk about me. They hate the fact that I had a brain. I say, you know what? This is not my life no more. I have a good family that gave me support and said, Jimmy, you know what? Come forward. Forget about this life. You're not a gangster. You're not a mobster. And, uh, you know, that's what I did. And for my cooperation, I got eight years. You know, I didn't get no slap on the wrist. You know, I did eight years for that. So, yeah, you're right. Frankie Rizzo, you're right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Fuck the haters. Absolutely. But these guys, you know what it is? Everyone on YouTube has something to say, you know, and these people, they never did nothing in their life. They probably live in their mother's basement. They never had a girlfriend. They don't have no children. They probably work in Peco and there's nothing going on. So they're just angry. They're angry of the fact 
that I made a wise decision, you know, and I got out of that life. So this bothers them. I'm happy it bothers them. But look, I was never a made guy. And I have this platform and I'm just moving on in life. You know, I want to do better. I want to help people. And that's where I am. But uh, I'll pull up a few chats until Tommy Dates comes in. What's up, Jimmy? Can't wait to hear the stories about Papa's from the encyclopedia Tommy Dates. You're right. He is a, it, Tommy Dates is an encyclopedia, 100%. Uh, yes, he is. But, uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the chats over here. So, Boston J, Jimmy, I couldn't listen to that show. It made my blood boil. And you know what, Boston J, what do you think about my blood? My blood boils too because these guys are cowards. All these guys on YouTube, they're all cowards. You know what? They're talking about mob shit, and they never did nothing. They never did a fucking thing. They're a joke. It's so it, it, it's ridiculous. They're nothing but a joke. Anthony C, you've mentioned a lot of Boston guys I know. Well, I did a lot of time with Boston guys. All the Boston guys I did time with, in all honesty, they were all tough guys. You know, Boston guys. A lot of Irish guys, Italian guys. Let me... Anthony Muros. Jimmy, do you remember Danny the Wig? I don't know. I probably knew him, but I didn't know him by Danny the Wig. No. Miss can't be wrong. Kills people to see people do good. Miss can't be wrong. You know what? You are so right about that. It does. It kills people when people are doing good. Uh, they're envious. They're jealous. They wish they had my strength. They really do. And then you got these guys where they say they believe in Jesus. They uh, do the rosary. But meanwhile, they're talking trash about other people. I mean, you're a hypocrite. That's what you are. Michael La Figueroa. Jimmy, what do you know? Oh, what, do you, what do you do now for work? Best of luck. What I do now, I drive a truck. That's what I do. When people ask personal questions like that, in all honesty, I think it's really kind of ignorant. I mean, this YouTube, you don't tell anybody about your personal business because uh, a lot of trolls, everyone's a troll. You can't trust nobody on here, you know? You know, you see people on here and you want to give them the benefit of the doubt and reach out and be kind to them. But you can't trust nobody over here. Let's see, Frankie Rizzo. Frankie Rizzo. These are miserable people. Misery loves company, needs company. Frankie Rizzo, you know what? You're so right about that. Misery loves company, and it's the truth. Margaret Hearn. Jimmy, hate is going to hate, and God forbid anyone tries not only change their life as well, help dispel glorification, that life by telling truth and encouraging today's youth, stay in school and get an education. And that's just what I do. You know, people are mad. They don't want to see no one else excel in life. You know, they want to see you do good, but not better than them. And that's the truth. Michael Boonton, are you working out? It makes the haters a little easy to take. Every so often, Michael, I take care of myself. I do. As you see, I'm trying to lose a little weight, get a little fit. Live and let live. It's good to see you in the chat, my moderator. Austin J. They they come, brother. Me, I'm not playing with them. 
I stay out of their rooms because I will not support people bashing my big brother. Love you, Jimmy. Love you too, Jay. Matthew Soto, thank you for the 499. The boat found God. Have you heard? Happy for him. Hopefully it's Jesus. Well, if he found God, you know what? That's really great. And, uh, you know, I wish him the best in life. I really do, you know. Uh, you know, look, you start out as a baby into a young boy, and then you grow your life. And, you know, I always said it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And, you know, I spent time with Sammy. And I enjoyed Sammy's company. He made me laugh. We had some, you know, uh, nice days together we spent. And, uh, you know, I don't, I haven't talked to Sammy in a while. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Jimmy, love what you do, but by calling them out is only validating these trolls. You notice Sammy never responds to what is said about him. It just gets even similarly with his podcast. Well, you know what? Listen, everyone is different, you know? So uh, people address things differently. You know, I'm not Sammy. Sammy's not me, you know? You know, after a while, you get sick of these people. And, uh, you know, I do want to address it. And maybe you're right. Don't address it. Ignore them. But these people are cowards. They're parasites. Joey D. Scott H., did the bull say he had a religious experience? So did Bobby Louisi. Who am I to doubt? Spring cleanup. Are you working with Dominic Crea, Jimmy? This drama seems cooked up. You're promoting them by mentioning them. Well, you know what? You're right about that. I am promoting them by mentioning them. You're right. But, uh, you know, sometimes you got to mention these people, you know saying, but I got to mention also that they're a bunch of punks. So, Jimmy, shout out Ireland. Ireland has your back, Jimmy. Thank you. And I got your back too. Very kind of you. So, what time is it? Let's see. I've got five minutes, and the Tommy Days will come on. So, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about. Jerry Papa, I got some photos we're going to be throwing up as we talk about them. This way it can entertain you guys. Now, Tommy Dades arrested John Papa. Okay, now the kid John Papa, the kid was a wild man, you know. Uh, he killed his own friends because maybe a friend or two of his was bragging about something they did that John Papa did. So they wanted to take their credit, so he killed them because they were bragging that they did the murder and he didn't do the murder. I mean, it's pretty, these people are fucking sick. They really are, they're sick. Joey Doves, how's mama? Where's Joey Doves? I don't see him in the, in the chat. David Cole, I love how you give Jesus your love by talking about God. Amen. God first, of course. Roderick Molina. Jimmy, John Papa was a little younger than you. Yes, he was a little younger than me, a couple years. Uh, I honestly didn't care for the kid. You know, uh, the kid was, you could see that the kid really wanted to be somebody. Like, you know, some people try too hard. You know, when you just want to kill people and kill your own friends, that's one thing about me in life. Like, I never wanted to kill my friends. You know, I was more like I kill for my friends. You know, I never wanted to kill my friends. That's, I don't know, you know. But thank God I'm out of that life. It's a garbage life. It's trash. There's nothing good about that life. Everyone in that life, their parents cry and the the families get destroyed 
The New York Dad Fight Hours. Thanks, New York Dad. I appreciate it. Most of the haters never lived the way we lived. But you are a great inspiration to many of us. Thank you, Jimmy. Keep up the great work. Thank you, New York Dad. I appreciate that. But I still want those sneakers. John Dillia, $100. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Glad you are big on redemption. So am I. Would you talk a little about what it means to you? Redemption? Well, listen, redemption is very important because, look, you know, every day I wake up and I want to do the right thing. I want to make my crooked pass right, which I feel like I can't because people keep on bringing it back up. You know, I talk about it because the reason I talk about it is, you know, I have PTSD. You know, I see a therapist once a month, whether I talk to the therapist for 15 minutes 30 minutes, maybe something's bothering me. At least after I talk to that therapist, you know what? I know that whatever I tell that therapist, it stays there. So I trust that therapist. Other people you can't trust because people you tell them things and what they do is it goes everywhere. They tell everybody. You know, so, uh, you know, every day I try to make my crooked pass right. And if I can help anybody out there, like I said, to anyone in the chat, if you own a business, you know, you can reach out to me and what I'll do is I'll advertise your business for you. Okay. That's what I want to do. I want to help you guys. Like you guys help me by coming in and uh, supporting me. I want to do the same for you. Tommy Dades is here. So I'm going to let Tommy Dades in. Okay. And then uh, we're going to chop it up. We're going to discuss this, the papas. And we're going to give you a good show tonight, okay, guys? So far, we got 271 people in the chat. And here's Tommy Dades. My man, Tommy Dades. What there we are. Pow, 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 pow. How's everything? Uh, how are you doing, Dad? How are you, Jimmy? Good. You're looking good. You're looking good. <laughs> yeah, you always tell me that. I wish I feel good. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you. So far, we got 275 people in the chat. It's, I mean, that's good for a start, huh? Yeah, I think so. I'm very confident. Hey, look, you know, you know what it is? Look, when you come on, people like you. I'm washed up. Why do you like me? <laughs> I'm old news. Uh, hey, let me, uh, blood on a razor wire, 999. Thanks. Tommy R. Uh, was my good buddy. He's talking about Tommy Reynolds. Hold on, let me read this. I did all of his legal work in prison for him, including his compassionate release motion, 2241 release Tommy. Well, you know what? I don't know anything about any motions because I know when you take a plea, I don't know what kind of motion you get. Tom, I don't know. Do you get a motion? I mean, unless they think something, uh, they found something in, in, in the court documents that were improper, and we're going to try to get a retrial based on that. But once you plead out, you know, it's pretty much a wrap. You can't go to the appellate division. You know what I'm saying? Like, you plead out, you don't have an appeal. You know, it takes your right of appeal away. That's what, I, that, that's, what I, that's what I always thought. Unless they found something, they thought they found something really improper. But listen. Jim Walden is probably the brightest uh, attorney that I know. He's as straight as an arrow. And Tommy, you know, listen, he know he knows what he did. You know what I'm saying? So there was no no misappropriation, no 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 Shanghai and nobody. He was guilty. And Tommy had an opportunity to uh, straighten his life out and change it and come the right way, but uh, he he declined. So and and the thing is this, you know, we all choose our own pets. And uh, you know what? Listen, I wish Tommy the best out there. And uh, you know what? Hopefully someday he makes it home. And, he, you know, I heard he found God. And if he did, you know what? God as bless him. As he was on the street when I spoke to him, um, you know, and I offered him, you know, a, a deal, which he declined. Um, he was a total gentleman to me. So, you know, whatever he did to everybody else, I know he did some bad things. That's he's going to have to make peace with God with that. But as far as the way he spoke to me, he spoke to me like a gentleman. You there, Jim? You froze. Yeah, you hear me? 
Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, just just uh, my internet goes in and out because I got three kids upstairs on the internet. <laughs> All right, but it, it it'll it'll reboot eventually. It'll reboot. Kevin Kevin Buchanan, thank you for the ten dollars and uh, the razor wire. Thank you, I appreciate that. Very kind of you. So listen, we're gonna start this show, okay? Uh, if I go in and out, Tommy, just keep on going because right. you know you have your internet and stuff like that. But uh, all right. So today we're gonna be talking about Jerry Papa and his son John Papa. Now you know Jerry Papa was a a wise guy in the Genovese family. Uh, you know, as you know, he was a killer. He dealt in narcotics. And uh, he killed a lot of people. How many murders, Tom? Suspected in 37. Um, after he got killed, I know the homicide squad, like, immediately were able to, what's called an, except, an exceptional clearance, had enough circumstantial evidence to prove that he did 16. So they closed 16 murders out immediately, and he was suspected in about 37. Wow. So as soon as, as, soon as they killed them, they closed 16 murders. Yep. Wow. I inherited, I inherited, what, what happened was when I was working in the 6-H squad, in the back room, there were cabinets, and that used to be what's called the 12th homicide zone. There were murders in there from the 50s till they went to specialization, and uh, they stopped the, hom the 12, like the different zones for homicides, and they had the Brooklyn South Homicide Squad and the Brooklyn North Homicide Squad. But all those folders were left behind. And I had an interest in Jerry Papa. And he was already dead, you know, when I when I pulled his case. And uh, I read through the whole fold. I saw the crime scene pictures. Um, there's, there's different theories on, uh, and I'll get into it, on who ki actually killed him. I could tell you who ordered it and why. Um, but I kept his case and I closed it out, you know, after the chin had been indicted. Uh, one of the predicate acts on Shin's indictment was Je ordering Jerry's murder. And uh, he happened to beat that uh, on his uh, trial. That was one of the predicate acts that they found him not guilty on. But there's no doubt that the Shin had to give the nod on that. And I can tell you the chain of how it went and why. All right. So we'll, we'll start with Jerry Papa and then we'll get into John Papa because you actually arrested John Papa. He, he uh, me and John Papa have a... a not a very good history together. <laughs> let's put it that way. Yeah you, yeah, you got some good stories about him. But uh, let's let's start with Jerry Papa now. Uh, where where you want to start? I mean, Jerry Papa was uh, um, born in he, was he hung out in Bensonhurst with uh, with uh, where, where Sammy grew up, where uh, Frankie DeChico grew up. He was a member of the Rampers with Joe Vitale, with uh, Ralph Spiro, with uh, Shorty Spiro, with Sammy, with Jimmy Emma, you know, with that whole crew. You know, they had, uh, he was the boss of the Rampers at one time. And uh, Sammy eventually became the boss of the Rampers. Look at this guy. He says, Jerry Papa buried someone with his head under the every day. The guy's name is... Uh, was uh, Richard Scarcella. That's the guy that he buried him with Shorty Spiro under the foundation of a bathroom at 90 Scott Avenue, Arista Windows. And he used to take a piss in the toilet and say I was pissing on his face. That's how sick he was. And Look who we Go ahead. He did, he did that murder with a guy named Joey Mezzone. And uh, we will, I mean, we, we could go, we'll get into that. I'll get into that whole thing with you. But I just so, want to I want to say hello. I want to say hello quick to Maria Padone. <laughs> Maria Padone's in the chat. <laughs> oh, and by the way, um, Janine, you know who she is. Said she's gonna give you a beating unless you send the t-shirts. <laughs> but, 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 but you know what, Janine? You know, look, I have to say hello. Uh, haven't seen you in so long. And uh, what I'll do is the next time I see Tommy, I drop off some mugs, some hats, and some T-shirts for you. And uh, you know, I appreciate you. I grew up with you, and giving you a shout out to Janine. So Jerry Papa, he was one of the leaders of the Rampers. Yes. Now he he got straightened out in 1974. Yes. 
Okay. He the became guy that sponsored him, I believe, was uh Swaggy. That Swaggy. was the guy that sponsored him. And now Swaggy, Swaggy yes. Now Swaggy, I remember Swaggy lived on uh Rutherford, I think Bay 17th or Bay 16th. And he had a social club on the Utrecht Avenue in the 70s. I mean, and he was he was a he was a big guy, Swaggy. He was a captain in uh in the cap he was a captain in the Genovese family, yeah. So now you know, little Georgie Adamo's father, Georgie Crowbar, was murdered by Jerry Papa. Okay, it was, it was a double murder. It was La a guy named Laraca and Adamo. They, they it, he obviously didn't do it by himself. This guy Joey Mazzone, who was eventually murdered too, was another partner in crime at Jerry's that they did murders together, and they found Laraca and Adamo in the back of a van wrapped in uh, either it was a tarp or carpeting, whatever. And they parked that van like on the corner of Carmine Persico's house, which yeah. didn't go over too well. They were, they were uh, taped and gag tied. Yeah. And you know what? Georgie Crowbar and Charlie LaRocca, they were tough guys. They were known to be tough guys, you know? So it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, they obviously met, uh, Jerry Papa, there might have been some kind of deal that went down. Jerry Papa probably caught a delusion on them, and you know what? He uh, he took them out. Which you know what? Unfortunately, that's how that life is. The rumor was if Jerry asked you for a lift home, don't go. <laughs> really, and uh, now there's also a story of uh, Jerry Papa where there was a, a shootout somewhere, and he runs into a precinct. That's when um, he gets. That's when uh, there's a shooting. There's a shooting where uh, he jumps into the back of a car. Sammy gets shot and uh, grazed, and uh, somebody else with, that was with them. I think uh, I don't know if it was Joey Vitali. They get shot and grazed too. Um, and Jerry supposedly went to the six-two precinct. And uh, Sammy supposedly spoke to the detectives there, or they spoke to him and showed him paperwork that, that like, Jerry was looking to uh, file a complaint, basically, and, and, and seek refuge inside of the 6th Precinct. And after that, that's when Sammy ended up becoming uh, the boss of the Rampers. Wow. And this is Jerry Papa, guys. If that's you want to see who, who we're talking about, that was Jerry Papa. Now, we could. You want to keep on going on with Jerry Papa, or you want to get into John Papa? I mean, Jerry, we go. We go through it. Some of the people sounded interested in uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry did. He, they killed. Uh, they killed this guy uh, Scarcella and Shorty Spiro. This is the reason we get get into that and go. This is the reason he dies. They get into. Uh, he kills. He kills Scarcella. He kills Shorty Spiro. They bury them in a storefront, like on seven between Seven and Eighth Street, Third Avenue, and they were afraid that too many people knew that uh, the bodies were there. So they end up moving those bodies to a place that uh, that uh, they a place that that called Arista Windows, and they bury the bodies in the foundation of a bathroom at Ninety Scott Avenue. And, and this is and this is Shorty Sparrow. Shorty Sparrow. That's Angelo Seppi's uncle, and Angelo Seppi ends up killing the guy Joey Mazzone because he was suspected in being part of the murder of Shorty Sparrow. That was an off the record murder, and Shorty was a captain in the Colombo family. And uh, then um, Angelo, then, then Seppi and his girlfriend, they knew who killed them because they let them in, and they're both killed. And that murder still to this day is unsolved. But he, he was trying to track down everybody had anything to do with his uncle's murder. And uh, there was a source that the, uh, I don't know if it was the feds or the Brooklyn DA's office had that uh, led them to the bodies at 90 Scott Avenue. And they dug the two bodies up and they were identified as this guy, Scarcella, Richard Scarcella and uh, Shorty Spiro. And that is what made, that's what, what happened was, uh, Swaggy was was his uh was his captain and it was 
where he got killed in Villa 66, that was really owned by Fonzual Thierry, who was like the front boss of the Genovese family at that time. And uh, he, uh, was, you know, he went to the boss, uh, the chin, and uh, told him, you know, he's got to go. He's a wild man. And he's, he was warned before Jerry, you know, to tone it down. And he was just killing for fun. He didn't, you know, follow any rules or, he, you know, he was killing anybody, no matter what you were. And uh, he ends up, he's, he's having coffee like he did, I think, for like 16 years in Villa 66. Uh, he's sipping espresso. There's, there's kind of, I'm not sure, like different court documents and stuff. Some name that there were three shooters, uh, Dominic Cataldo and his two nephews who were Colombo guys that were in there and killed him uh, with a shotgun. And I seen the crime scene pictures of him. They got him. He had no idea it was coming. And uh, they, they handcuffed the waitress in the back of the kitchen. Then there's other people. There was a guy that was arrested named uh, uh, Kriya, or Rea, Rea, excuse me, Rea, and uh, Armando Rea. And he was arrested 30 years after the fact for being one of the shooters. And he was living in Las Vegas. And, he, and the other name that pops up is a guy named Enrico Galante. His name is Red Hot. And just from what I've heard, maybe the, the Catalbo family did have something to do with it but this guy red hot that's the name that i always heard that actually pulled the trigger on jerry and he was a hitman he was a, in, in attica he was involved in the 1970 attica riots he was just a straight out stone cold killer from downtown brooklyn and uh you know i i could be wrong about you know the, the mixture of people that actually did it but in my belief i can tell you my 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 from what i've heard red hot was his nickname, Enrico Galante, definitely was one of the guys in the Bill of 66 who killed him. And, and, and the thing is, you know what? In that life, you know, a guy like uh, Jerry Papa, you know, how he was sneaking guys, killing other made guys, does that usually happen in that life? Well, it's not supposed to, and that's why that it's called organized crime and not disorganized crime, but... When we really get down to it, if you really want to go back into the history of so many murders, guys will have a hard on for somebody that they really ain't supposed to kill, and they'll make an excuse and find something within the rules to have him killed, even though he wasn't guilty of that. Uh, it was just like uh, Frankie Bones and uh, Frankie Joya. They, you know, Frankie Maraconda was on record with Sammy the Bull. Yeah. And... They went out drinking with him, knew when they were going to kill him. It was over a girl. And it was an off-the-record murder. And when they dropped him off, um, Frankie Joya held him in the street, right up, right up the block from his house, while Frankie Bones killed him. And they played stupid. They actually went to the wake. And George Conti, I think, had an idea, you know, that they were responsible for it. There's a lot of people that had an idea, but they never admitted it to nobody until Frankie Joy cooperated, you know, and he gave it up. Hmm. And uh, so uh, Jerry Papa, he's sitting in his cafe, a uh, uh, little delicatessen, whatever it is, uh, having a cup of coffee, a little breakfast. Red Hot comes in with a sort of shotgun and blows his brains out. Blew his brains out. He was slumped over. It was June of 1980. He was slumped over on the table with the coffee there. And he had a 32 in his pocket, and uh, he blew his, half his head off. And Red Hot is my idol. <laughs> Listen, I mean, he, he killed a lot of people, Jerry, and he didn't kill – most of his murders weren't mob hits. They were, just, should, they were just murders. Someone should have had the balls to kill him sooner. Yep. Seriously. Kidding me. Street justice. Yep. All these tough guys. I'm saying they should have snuck him. But uh, but let's talk about John Papa, and we can always go back and forth with Jerry. But let's talk about John Papa because you know a lot about John Papa. John Papa was a wild man. He wanted to follow in his father's footsteps, and uh, so let's talk about him. John Papa, um, 
which is crazy is because organized crime killed his father. So, you know, why would you want to be bothered with people that, you know, you don't know who, as a matter of fact, the town goes apart the Colombo family and that's who Papa was associated with, was the Colombo family. So why would you bother with people that had something to do, whether your father was a good guy or a bad guy, would kill him. It's still your father. Anyway, he uh, he grew up in, uh, he was born in, in Brooklyn, and they moved him to Homedale, New Jersey. And uh, from what I understand, his mother tried to keep him in a straight line, but couldn't keep him from Brooklyn and Staten Island. And uh, he was killing at a young age. And John would kill all his friends and play to the families like you know he had no idea and still go eat at their houses or go to their wakes and i mean he was as low as you could get the only actual mob hit i mean the people he killed was rolando rivera was his friend why he killed him i have no idea um john sparacino was his dear friend he killed him because he supposedly was taking uh more credit for killing Joey Scopo because they were both at the scene of that murder. So he got jealous that John was getting more props for the murder. Um, he killed um, Eric Curcio for the same reason. Um, there was a kid named Peter Perry who really was no wise guy. I don't know if he dealt drugs or whatever, but you know, it was no bad, bad guy. He was talking on a phone booth and Papa killed him. Uh, so you had Scopo, you had Rolando Rivera, you had Eric Kirsch, you had John Sparacino, you had Peter Perry, and those are five that we know 100%. We can indicted him on four, not five, and he got convicted on all four, plus drug dealing. So he got four terms plus 45 years in prison. At the age of 21, it was September 27, 1997, that we locked him up. And I find out while we're looking for him, it was me and this agent, Matt Tormey, that really were the most, you know, most intricate part, you know, like in the case, there were other, other agents and detectives involved, but it was me and Matt that were doing everything on this case. And uh, we didn't want him to know. <clears throat> I found out through numerous sources, he was seen by my neighbors. He was sitting on my house and he wanted to kill me in front of my kids. And uh, that, like, to me, you know, from what I was told was he thought that if he killed me, and that means death before dishonor, I was there for that picture in Italian. He was reluctant to take his shirt off because he didn't want us to see the tattoo. That's the day, that's the morning of after we locked him up at night in front of St. Anne's Church. I mean, and, this, I, I mean this guy, he thought he was in a movie. He was gonna he was gonna try and kill me in front of my house. He sat on me at least three times. And uh so we weren't trying to find him like openly because we didn't want him taken off. And we had heard that uh John Sparacino's brother Sal was having a wedding. And uh we kind of just took a hunch that he would be in the bridal party. And we was me and Matt were sitting on the church, everybody was inside. And we were just about to leave, you know, and Papa pulls up like a half hour late with his girlfriend. And I told Matt, there he is. And I said, wait for him to get onto the church stairs. And as he gets on the church stairs, I'm in the passenger seat facing the church. Matt's driving. We both get out of the car. I got my gun out. Matt got his gun out. And I yelled to him, Tommy Dades, John, don't move. And his exact words to me were, yeah, right. And he bends down on one knee, and I yell, Matt, he's got a gun. He pulls out a nine millimeter Taurus. It seemed like a half hour for him to get the gun out because it was so big and he was so small. And he runs to the door, and all I see is people. And I, you know, I didn't pull the trigger. I held the door with my foot. He never turns on me. And I hear, I don't see, but I hear the gun hit the church floor and slide to the right. And Matt recovered the gun quick because there were a lot of guys in there. And I tackled John in the middle of uh, the aisle and handcuffed him up and I whisked him out of there. We called back for our guys to come. Matt stayed there and everybody was very pissed off. Uh, 
And Sal, who turned out to be a nice guy at the end of the day, uh, John's brother, but they were like, you got no respect. That detective is crazy. And Matt told him, he says, that detective just put the handcuffs on the, on the guy to put a bullet in your brother's head. Really, it was Calvin Hennigar, Matt, uh, John's, John's partner, that shoot him. And John was pissed off. Calvin, you know, he told Calvin he was coming back to the house. And John was with Calvin. And Calvin took, I think, a 22 and shot him in the back of the head. And John got there and was mad that he didn't get the opportunity to actually put the bullet in him. And they put him in a car and they drove it to Howard Avenue in Staten Island and they set the car on fire. Hmm. And uh, there's also a time when you have John Papp in the car in handcuffs or something. I think, was he in the front seat or something? And he tries to open up the door. There was and you're when I when I get him out of the church, there's an agent sitting in the you know driving the car. We're trying to just get out of there, get back to Brooklyn, and let everybody else handle the crowd. And uh, I'm sitting behind the driver, and Pop is sitting next to me in the back seat, and he's handcuffed, and he's like trying to play around, like almost trying to get the cuffs to his legs, like he's moving closer towards the door. And we're doing like 60, 70 miles an hour going over. I don't know if we're on the Verrazano Bridge or whatever. And I'm like, if you think I'm going to stop you from opening the door and jumping out, be my guest. <laughs> you know what I mean? What do I care? You jump you're gonna, out, goodbye. You're going to kick him out. <laughs> I care. Uh, but uh, now, he was also friendly with a guy, Joey Michio. Yes. Him and Joe Michio were best of friends. Now, Joe, yeah, Joe Michio, I had a confrontation with him one time. He came to uh, Bay 16th uh, with a pistol, and he wanted to talk to me. And Mike Yamini grabbed him, and I grabbed the pistol. And uh, because I was uh, dating some girl, Kelly, at the time when he was seeing her, and I didn't know him before, but these guys, they really wanted to be gangsters. Well, you know what? Michio was supposed to be on the scope of murder. But the reason he wasn't there is because he got locked up. Like, I think he was on Rikers Island for a month or two, and he missed it. But he was one of the guys with Messi Marvin in front of the house with the Rosa when Greg Scarpa, Joey Rendazzo, and Joey Scarpa were there. And uh, he, uh, he fired shots, too, when Greg shot the Rosa. But it was Marvin, you know, Joey Randazzo was really an innocent kid that got killed, and uh, Greg he, uh, he blew Greg's eye, uh, Marvin blew Greg's eye out. Michio was there, but Michio Papa blamed this guy Tigger Delavecchia for killing or being part of helping to kill his uh, his best friend. What happened was Tigger and Joe Caves. They I don't know if it's Tigger that lures him out and picks him up, and Joe Caves gets in the car. I forget exactly how it works, but Tigger's there. From what I understand and what I'm being told, you know, Tigger didn't know it was going to happen. Whether I believe that or not, it's another story. And uh, that night, uh, I remember we get a call that somebody's laying in the center on the yellow line on 17th Avenue and Bay 17th Street. And, and, who pulled, uh, and who pulled the trigger on that? From what I remember, it was Dino Calabro, Saracino, and Joe Caves were involved in that murder. Why they killed him, I don't know. He was all, you know, Michio was also like kind of Colum a Colombo associate too. And these guys were all Colombo guys. And they killed him in the back of a van. And he was laying face down on the yellow line. And uh, felt bad for his mom. His mom was from the other side. And, uh, Papa, that's Joe Caves. Jack, that guy killed a cop. So I, I look at his face. I get sick to my stomach just looking at him. You just want to bite his face. He killed Ralph Doles, and he should burn in hell for it. Hmm. And I hope he's listening. Oh, they're, they're, they're listening. Don't worry. They're listening. And this is the kid, Dino Calabro. Another punk. Yep. Another punk. Yep. Let's look at him again. Real, real brave. They kill a cop that pulls up after working a 4 to 12, you know, going home to his wife and kid, and they assassinate him. Real tough guys. I want to go in the backyard and pick up their hands and see how tough they are. 
and guys socialize with them. Yes, but, uh, socialize with them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know what, let's shoot to, now, there's a time where this guy, Teddy Persigo, goes to a funeral. Yep. And let's talk about that. He goes to a wake. I forget whose wake it was for. He's in custody with the marshals there. And he whispers in someone's ear that's part of the team of going out to kill Joey Scopo that Joey Scopo's got to go. And then a team is assembled to kill Joey and it's done. And Joe Scopo, Joey Scopo was a very power. Joey Scopo, I, I mean, from my view, like I would compare him to the same type of guy as a Frankie DeChico, that's Joey. And uh, I'll compare him to a guy like Frankie DeChico. You know, he wasn't a disrespectful guy. He was a very big guy in statute, and he was a very powerful guy. He was the underboss of the arena faction of the Colombo family. And uh, he was very, very close with John Gotti. You know, he was probably over at the, you know, Ravenite or the Bergen Hunt Fish Club more than he was anywhere else, you know. And, and at this time, there's a Colombo war going on. Yes. So. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kind, kinds of things going on at this time. They, and, uh, you know, people say that the murder of Joey Scopo ended the war. I'm not going to say it didn't help end the war. There he is right there with his brother Ralph. And that's his father, who's also a May guy. Now, these guys at the time, you know, this is when the mob was like really the mob because, you know, he was big in the construction, wasn't he? They were true gangsters, yeah. 100%. Big, big, big uh, in the unions, big money makers, big earners, and very capable guys if they had to be. You know what I'm saying? But uh, people definitely feared Joey. He had tough guys around him. Um, and they figured if they got rid of him, he was a very intimidating factor for the arenas. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was a combination of Joey Scopo getting killed, of Greg Scarpa becoming incarcerated. Um, you know, after that shooting with uh, DeRosa when they didn't let him out of jail again. And then Carmine Sessa cooperating where we did, you know, with the FBI and NYPD, we did a major takedown of not only everything Carmine Sessa gave us, but a bunch of other different pieces of investigations where we took a lot of guys down. That kind of put a period at the end of it, and they eventually made a truce. In my opinion, the last murder of the Colombo War was Wild Bill. Because Alley Boy rocked him to sleep, you know, and he was never going to forgive Billy, even though they were very close prior to the war. He was never going to forgive Billy for not siding with him. I tell you, and uh, Wild Bill was a class act, but I uh, like Billy. but you know, I want to talk about uh, now. Okay, so they're planning on killing Joe Scopo. Who's involved in that hit? Anthony Russo, um, who was a street boss. Uh, with the Colombo family, uh, Frank Herrera, also known as BF, um, Eric Curcio, who came from downtown. That's uh, BF, that's Fat Sal, and that's that's Russo. Now, let's explain. Now, Fat Sal was one of the guys that went went to go looking for Sammy in Arizona. Him and Huck were, were the two guys that were out in Arizona conspiring to kill Sammy. It's something I I tell you, you know what you know what's amazing is that the neighborhood uh produces all these young guys uh that want to be in the mob and eventually they all have some kind of uh you know interaction where like you know fat sal who would think that fat sal would go uh look for sammy you know i'm saying i when i knew fat sal on the street i knew fat sal as a bank robber i didn't know fat sal as you know a hitman Neither did I, and uh, for what I guess they pro I know they promised Huck to get pushed up, bumped up to a skipper if they got it done, and they probably promised Fat Sal that he'd get straightened out. You know, my opinion, just my opinion, I'm not no, you know, I wasn't involved in any of that, but my opinion is that uh, after they killed him, Huck would have killed Fat Sal and left him there. You know, that's my opinion. So, so John Papa, he jumps out of a bush. And he shoots Joe Scopo. Sparacino is, I don't know what he's got. He's got some kind of crazy gun and just firing crazy. And uh, 
Scopo was in the car with his future son-in-law and his nephew, I believe. One of them actually gets grazed, and they're shooting back. Um, at least one guy was shooting back. And Scopo jumps out of the car, and Papa, he may have been wounded already, but Papa jumps out of the bushes with a hoodie over his head, and I believe it was a 380, and let's go on Scopo. And Scopo threw a cell phone at him and basically cursed him out. As he said, he was, yeah, he said something like, you little punk. Yep. And uh, it's something oh, because... Yeah, whatsoever. I, I, I'll tell you, you know what? You, you know what something is that like how, you know, they talk about May guys and associates and this guy, John Papa, this kid, John Papa was a nobody, just a little punk on the street, you know, killing his best friends and trying to become a wise guy and get made. And, you know, he kills a May guy in that family, like Joey Scopo. He was old when he killed him. How old was he? 18 years old. Yeah. Wow. 18 years old. Now, how about uh, now this guy? That's a sad story. Uh, his name is Carmine Gargano, and um, he was a college boy that came from an amazing family. Uh, great mom, great dad, great brothers. He had, you know, like everybody's mischievous as a kid, you know, maybe he was a little mischievous. Um, he had a, a problem with the Roser at a club called T Birds. And Papa, um, Papa blamed Tigger. This is the part I'm not sure of, you know. I, I mean, I'll tell you what I know, but Joe Caves pleads guilty to killing Carmine. And when they asked him for a motive, it was like, because I felt like it. So he don't give him a real motive and supposedly he killed him alone. And he was, like I said, he was, he wasn't, he was no killer. He was no bad guy. He was a college kid. Came from a hardworking Italian family who uh, were great, great people, you know. And uh, this broke, this is kind of like destroyed that. I seen firsthand how this destroyed that family and, and uh, beyond recovery. Um, so Papa heard DeRosa threaten Carmine and say he was going to kill him. And DeRosa and Papa tells Moran, Papa told Moran every murder he did. And uh, he tells Moran that uh, I'm going to kill, if I can't kill Tigger, because he tried to kill Tigger and was grabbed and said that Tigger's around Jimmy Gallion to start a war. And the words were, I'll kill his cousin. And then he eventually, so he says, everyone will think DeRosa did it because DeRosa just threatened him in front of like God knows how many people. And uh, we went after, that's how the case started. We went after DeRosa and that whole crew and Jimmy Gallione. And that's what led us to go after you and, and the whole Bad Davin, you crew and everybody in between. You know, we locked everybody up trying to get somebody to tell us what happened to Carmine Gargano? When I was getting the threatening Christmas letters to me and Galetta at my house from Moran, he was sending pictures of somebody machine gunning our families and Carmine Gargano buried. And so when Moran cooperated, he told us that Papa told him the day or the day after that he killed Carmine and that Carmine will never be found. Carmine, what? Well, was never found because when they buried him, they built some kind of a strip mall. They could never get to him. And that's supposedly where Richie Greaves is too. But uh, how did Papa know that? You know what I'm saying? That always, I always believe Papa, Papa killed Carmine until Joe Caves cooperated. I mean, he's not gonna cop to a murder he didn't do, but I still question how did Papa know he died that day and didn't come home? And I know for a fact Joe Caves picked him up, was the last one to pick him up. But and how did he know he'd never be found? So he knew he was buried. You know, so that's just a question I always have. But that poor family, you know, they're such good people and uh, that kid, that kid was he was harmless. He I mean, he was a strong kid, he was no punk, but you know, he didn't he didn't deserve what he got. And Joe Caves like picked the victim for, for no reason. He didn't even have an answer for why he killed him. 
you know. He, he he just he just killed him because you know why? He uh listen, you got kids out there that what they do is they see a kid that is innocent. You know what? This is an easy kill. Let me put him underneath my belt. And that's how it is the street. Some some guys, you know. What happened and, was we we had a search warrant on a body shop where they originally buried Carmine, and we missed the right body shop. We hit a different body shop, and we dug up the floor. And when we dug up the floor, they moved him and they moved Richie Greaves out to Farmingdale, Long Island, where they found Wild Bill. Why they never moved Wild Bill, I don't know, because they eventually found Wild Bill's body there. But Richie Greaves and Carmine's body, unfortunately, were never recovered for their families, which is very sad. I'll tell you something, because, you know, when I was out there, you know, Paulie G and uh, my crew had beefs with... Uh, the Bay Parkway kids, and then you had the Rose and his crew. Then you had, uh, you know, uh, John Papa and his, like you had all these crews throughout the whole neighborhood. Then you got Jimmy Galeone and his crew. I mean, it's insane. I mean, how the neighborhood was at that time. Everybody every, was all over the map. I mean, there were people under everybody's umbrellas. There were massive shootouts between crews, like, I mean, like two armies shooting at each other in a schoolyard. You know, it was some crazy shit that was going on, you know? I mean, Marvin and DeRose are the ones that told us that uh, George Conti, I think it was George Conti who was leading it, um, that gas pipe was getting moved from MCC. And he had everybody show up at MCC with guns, with the intentions of shooting gas pipe out of custody of the Bureau of Prisons and the U.S. Marshals. And they were there. The overt action happened. They were all there with guns for whatever reason. Thank God for the Bureau of Prison guards and the Marshals because they were never expecting it. You know, uh, they called it off. But Moran and DeRosa were both present for that, along with Conti and a bunch of other guys. So that's and, how crazy that was. And you know what, Tom? It's a... Uh... You know, you take down these cases, and as you take down these cases, guys cooperate. So when guys cooperate, what they do is now they're building other cases. That's what we did. We went from one to the other to the other to the other, you know. And, you know, it was, uh, it was you know, listen, it was uh, a lot of madness going on back then. There were some short little things that we did in the midst of doing the bigger ones. But it was the FBI, the DEA, the NYPD, the Brooklyn DA's office, the Eastern District. It was a major effort with a bunch of great working guys. But nobody was, you know, listen, we were doing our job and guys in the street were doing their job. If you got caught, you got caught. If you were smart and you wanted to change your life, you know, you cooperated and you were given a second chance. And most of the guys, most of the guys, not all, but most of them that cooperated with, you know, our guys like yourself, you know, did very good for themselves in, in, in life and, uh, you know, went on to live a, a very, very normal, decent life and, and uh, have, have a second chance at life. Hmm. Now, let me uh, just throw a, a photo up over here. Let me see who this is over here. That's how my person go. I mean, that's a sharp looking picture of him at that time, you know. Uh, this is no, Joe Scopo. This is the article when he gets pinched, John Papa. Yep. And here is Ali Boy. I mean, Ali Boy Persico. Ali Boy Persico. And this is John Papa. From what I understand, he's got internet in prison, so he may be watching us right now. Yeah, if not, he'll be watching us tomorrow. But uh, this is a photo I'm looking for right here. This is a photo where you see Tommy Karate standing next to John Papa. Yes. At the end, at the oh. end that's yep. Tommy Karate standing next to John Papa. And then... uh they made for each other. <laughs> oh, absolutely, 100%. Crazy photo, right? Yep, that's in. I think that's in Terre Haute. I'm not sure. Yeah, because I know that uh, Joey, uh, um, what's happened to my brain? Um, 
the Gemini, Anthony Center and Joey. Joey Testa. Joey Testa. I know Joey Testa was doing jail time with Papa for a while in Terre Haute, Indiana. And this is. Uh, That's Carmine Sessa. Carmine Sessa. You know, Carmine Sessa goes off to testify against his own brother. Carmine, uh, he was he was a high ranking member that cooperated during the war and was responsible for really he his testimony gave up a lot of stuff, you know. A lot of stuff. I tell you, Tom, you know what? You took down a lot of cases. I mean, you know, it was a group, it was a group effort, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was lucky to be involved in a lot of the high profile cases. You know, I worked with some great guys and I learned a lot and uh you know, some I took the initiative on, some I just, you know, was involved in with them and brought in on with them. But I worked with some fantastic guys, you know, great agents, great U.S. attorneys, federal state prosecutors, detectives. You know, me and the letter were together for 11 years, me and Jimmy Hawkins, you know, that was the team, you know. And uh, I'll tell you, you know what, I just look back and I look at all these murders in the neighborhood. Wild Bill, uh, you know. All these murders, I mean, it's pretty crazy, you know, how uh, back then and now, you know what, no murders. Well, there's a million reasons for that. There's no murders, number one, because there's cameras everywhere. So if you're going to kill somebody, you know, it, it's got to be done. You can't just drive by in a car no more. They got tracking on license plate. I mean, the technology now, it's not like the old days. The other end of it is, is that organized crime is uh, maybe they maybe they're a little being a little smarter because anytime you do a homicide, that's what lights a, a match and ignites investigation. So by keeping violence down and no bodies falling in the street, it kind of keeps a lot of heat off that would normally come down on them. Or it's just not what it used to be. I think it's a combination of all three. You know. Yeah. And this is a BF, a photo of BF over here. Yep. He's out out of prison. And he's one, he was one of Alley Boy's good friends, right? Yep. Very good friends with Alley Boy involved in at least five murders that I know about. That's, that's uh, insane. Seriously. And they're out, you know? It's crazy, I tell you. But, uh, I mean, you know, we could go back to Jerry Papa. And talk a little about him, uh, a little more about him. Jerry, uh, what's funny is you mentioned BF. BF lived at 1265 Shore Parkway, uh, apartment 2C. And we did a search warrant on his apartment. And uh, I find out later on that Jerry Papa kills Jimmy Gallion's father in the doorway the same apartment that's where ralph gallion was living and that's where he got killed but it, it, isn't that crazy i mean uh ralph gallion he was involved with the jimmy brackney murder with john gotti john gotti and angelo vigerio and then this guy jerry papa ends up killing him why he kills him i have no idea but he goes to his door they knew each other he opened his door and he just killed him right in the doorway I mean, it's fucking crazy. I mean, this guy was just going around killing anybody. It's insane. He was suspected in 37 murders. <laughs> I mean, it's wow. a lot of killing. That's that, was, that means, like, I believe the 37 murders he was suspected in, it wasn't like, you know, he planned it or, you know, someone else. I believe he was suspected in killing 37 people himself, you know? It's crazy. I tell you, it really, it really is insane. Uh, it boggles my mind. I, yeah, it really. you know what, it's, it's, uh, I mean, think about that. Imagine 30, so you killed 37 people. Like, how do you go to bed at night? You know what I mean? And, and most of the murders were, were, were like, in his mind, fun murders. They really were not, not necessary homicides. They weren't mob hits. You know what I mean? Some, maybe a few were, but the, most of his murders were just murders that people didn't deserve to even get a smack in the mouth. And you know what? That's how it was back then. You know, with uh, you know, the killings. You know, uh, anybody could get killed. I mean, you couldn't trust anybody. Nope. Nope. Your best friend 
like you know they say in the cliche in all these movies it's the best friend that's gonna tell you to come over and that's the guy that's gonna kill you look at paulie galino you know and you know what who, who would think i mean look at paulie g they knocked on his door he let them in uh you know he thought he was letting in a friend you and the thing, the thing with that was you know his mom and dad i think they were at a christening or communion or something yeah they were at a christening and uh you know they asked him for something to drink and That's, uh it's kind of sad uh for them to have to come home and you know god forbid a million times even thinking of anything like that imagine what what, what happened to them you know yeah, it's insane but uh Wednesday night, I'm gonna be uh You gotta have do Wednesday night. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have police off the cuff, Phil and Bill at 7 p.m. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh you know, I'm thinking uh you know, but you know, we could also talk about Fat Sal. This is Fat Sal that he was involved in going to you know uh grab Sammy. Right, they were gonna kill Sammy. They came very close to it. I think Sammy, from what I remember back then, I think he was like a week away from getting killed before he got arrested. And by him getting arrested, saved his life. And then Fat Sal, I think it was my team that locked him up for bank burglaries. And uh, he reached out to the FBI and uh, they took him and he, uh, he gave up that whole murder conspiracy with Huck. And Huck couldn't get too close to Sammy because Sammy would know who Huck is. Sammy did a lot of work for, you know, uh, Huck did a lot of work for Sammy. They knew each other forever. And, uh, you know, he had to keep a distance. And I know they had two ways that they were planning on killing him. One was by a scope with a rifle. The other thought, I think, was blowing up his car. And, uh, is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not funny. Um, I had to reach out to the FBI because uh, Papa conspired to kill Sammy too. When Sammy at first, uh, not when he first cooperated, when when he was looking at me, there was also evidence to show that he was looking or talking about going to kill Sammy. And I would never put it past him because you know that would have that would have put him in uh, you know in his mind in in, in like the, the the Hall of Fame of organized crime. Wow. Yeah. So guys, uh, if you got any questions, throw in the questions. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to having Bill and, uh, Phil on Wednesday night. You know, I'm going to have uh, a couple questions for them. I'm going to have some fun with them. I'm not going to have them on too long, maybe an hour or something, but, uh, you know, I appreciate hey, them. Uh, coming. You're going to have Glaze on. Glaze. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Thank you for re for reminding me. Yes, Gla Brian Glaze Gibbs. I'm going to have him on uh, probably uh, next week sometime. And I'll, hopefully I'll be on his channel too. He's uh, from the Pink Houses, Tom. He ran the Pink Houses in East New York in the heyday, late 80s, early 90s. And he changed his life completely. But he was a major force to be reckoned with, you know. You know what? This was a good question. This guy asked. He said, "What crew was your team most afraid of on the street? Like, you know, mob team? Afraid of us personally being afraid of them? No, no, no. you being afraid of them? Like, very leery of them? Like, I don't know when you had to go pick them up or something." You, you know, when you went out to anybody, you know, you didn't put anything um, past anyone, you know, because uh, the least person you could ever suspect. When you went into a place or you hit a door, you know, um, the, the right way to do it is in shock and awe, no matter who it is. I'm not saying some bookmaker that's 80 years old that you're going to do that to. I would never do that, you know, but... Uh, when you're going to hit guys that are involved, you know, in, in, in violent crimes or with a crew that's involved in violent crimes, you hit them with shock and awe. It doesn't just save your life. It saves his life because if he had a delusion of doing anything, he's never going to get a chance to do it. You know what I'm saying? We got to jump on him. It's not a street fight. 
we're not supposed to lose out there. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to win. And one way or the other, we're going to win. Sometimes, unfortunately, we get hurt. Sometimes, unfortunately, someone else is going to get hurt. Who had the most intimidating presence when you were going after somebody? Um, intimidating presence. Like, who intimidated you most? Nobody intimidated me. And I'm not saying that because I'm playing a tough guy. Uh, you know, if I was ever intimidated, then I needed to find another job. You know, I mean, there was an adrenaline rush. Uh, I enjoyed what I did. And, if you know, whatever was going to happen was going to happen. And I was going to do whatever I could not to make it be me that it happened to. Uh, I worked with some very ballsy guys. I trusted who was with me. And, you know, it's like, you know, you're going into battle, you know. I mean, maybe your heart's beating fast, like before you get into the ring for a fight, your heart's beating fast. But once, once the, you know, once it's on, it's on. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I got anybody specific, you know, that I could tell you that, you know, stands out that I was intimidated by. We were very cautious on anybody that we, we locked up, you know. And on the other hand, we've also done things in, in a gentleman's way where we could have knocked down a door but I had some kind of rapport with the guy and didn't want to upset the guy's family and knew the guy was going to, you know, he wasn't going to blow my brains out, you know, at least believed he wasn't. And, uh, you know, went to his house by a gentleman, knocked on the door and let him know everybody's around the block. I don't want to upset your mom and played like I was his friend. You know what I mean? So I have done things like that. Yeah. Now, I know you weren't intimidated because I know when you guys uh, strap up, you, you, you know, you're looking to take these guys down. They're wrong. He did run the pink houses. Who they're naming is, he absolutely 100. I speak to Brian all the time. It was Joe Ponzi, the chief of the Brooklyn DA's office, uh, who had Brian. They've actually done documentaries together. I'm not saying he had nothing to do with, he did have things to do with Pappy Mason and Fat Cat and did things in Queens, but in Brooklyn, in East New York, in the 7-5, Brian Gibbs was the man. This guy has a question. Sergio Leone, he's a filmmaker, this guy. Were the Gemini twins transferred to the Lucchese? How does that work? Now, I mean, they were, they the were test, with the Mayo. The test is all became Lucchese guys. Uh, they, you know, Joey Testa, Patty Testa, they were made guys in the Lucchese family. Joey Testa was doing plenty of murders for, for gas pipe. Um, uh, no, I never met Serpico. <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, what happens is, you know, he, they were affiliated with, with, the, with Roy DeMeo, who was a Gambino guy. And after they killed Roy, how they actually got released um, and ended up Lucchese guys, I mean, I know for sure Joey Testa did murders with Frankie Lastorino and Georgie Zappola. Um, and it was on the orders of Queso. One of those murders was definitely uh, involving with the mob cops. Um, Ex-Tommy Dates. Who killed Dino Saracino brother? What? Uh, that's, 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 uh, Dino Saracino. It wasn't who killed Dino Saracino. It was Frankie Saracino. Dino Saracino got jail time with his two friends testifying against him, Joe Caves and Dino Calabro. Frankie Saracino, they found under the outer bridge, burning, shot, and stabbed. And as far as I know, they didn't know who did it. You know, so that's still an open homicide. I don't want to have nobody shook back in the day, but thank you. You know, <laughs> I, just, I just tried to do my job and, you know, I, enjoy, hey. I enjoyed my job. Hey, Tom, how about... Who took down Tommy Karate? Tommy Karate was taken down. Um, the person who had, uh, there were several people who had some insights. I mean, me and you both know Frank Angie, may I rest in peace. Yeah. You know? um, Jamie Hunt and Eric Stangerby and the whole group from the DEA, uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, they had, you know, they were doing Tommy and following and had wiretaps and bugs and all kinds of stuff. And they were the ones that, you know, were building a major case against him. When Frankie 
uh, they pulled him over in a radio car. A radio car pulled him and a girl over. And Frankie, I guess, either from being drugged up or just guilt-ridden or both, I think, um, he started yapping to this cop in uniform about murders. And they brought him into the 6-2 precinct, and they called the uh, detective from the Homicide Squad, and they called George Terra, who was a detective and now working for the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office as an investigator. Um, and George stayed with Frankie through the whole night. He was good friends with Jamie Hunt and gave Frankie to Jamie. Um, and J Frankie filled in a lot of the pieces that the DEA just may have been missing some, but they had all the DEA had all the goods on, on Tommy and the whole crew when they locked him up. And it was the DEA that actually put handcuffs. It was Jamie Hunt who was the lead investigator on that case. He ended up the Boston, New York. Eric ended up the international Boston, New York. Two of the most amazing, eight, the whole group of them guys were like superstars. I mean, they locked up the Purple Gang that half the people I'm talking about really don't know who the Purple Gang was. And I tagged along just to go, you know, they, they just took me like for fun to see it. And these guys were amazing, amazing investigators, you know. So they're the ones who put the handcuffs on karate. And George Terra had Tommy Karate's gi which looked like it fit a kid, that's how small it was, with the black belt on it, with TK written on it, behind his door for about 15 years. And I never even know, I didn't ever notice who the hell's gear was until he finally told me. Joe Messina's Drill 2 has got John Gotti doing murder guys. Hate when people say Gotti didn't do work. Um, I'm sure John Gotti, you know, yeah, he did work, definitely. He had to do work. He was involved in the McBratney murder, you know. Um, I'm sure he did work when he was younger. This, you know, the one thing you're not going to take away from John Gotti, even though he wasn't, you know, the type of guy to run a family um, for obvious reasons, but the one thing I'll always say, and I'll give credit where it's due, he had balls of steel. He was a bona fide tough guy, grew up hard, you know. Um, I don't think he was really afraid of anybody. And, uh, you know, I mean, Joe Messina, what he knew, I mean, they were close, but don't forget, you know, you're not going to tell somebody everything you did or everything you didn't do. You know what I mean? So I believe John, def he, definitely did he was definitely involved in the McBr McBratney murder. You know, he's the one who brought Angelo Ruggiero and, uh, and uh, Ralphie Gallion with him. He was the one that was given the assignment to kill him for, for them killing Emmanuel uh, uh, get, uh, Gambino. They said that uh, John Gotti killed Tommy D. Simone. I no, you don't kill Tommy D. Simone, Tommy Agro. <laughs> and I know Tommy Agro killed Tommy D. Simone and his brother. And that's a fact. Wow, that's something. See that? That's wow. Fact. That's something. I'm, I'm not, Tommy Agro was a Gambino guy. And I'm not going to say that John maybe wasn't there, but for a fact, Tommy uh, Agro definitely killed, definitely killed Tommy D. Simone and his brother at two different times. Wow. That's something. Andrew B., thank you for the $20. I appreciate it. I see you. All right, Tom. Well, you know, listen, I'm not going to keep you too long. You know, we're on here. Uh, an hour, 18 minutes. We got 620 people in the chat. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Yeah, no, Tom, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you very much. And, uh, you know. I'm looking forward to seeing you, Bill, and Phil together. And I'm looking forward to the people listening to uh, Ryan Gibbs because it's a little different shoot of traditional organized crime. It's a different area where some crazy shit was going on and just for people to know in 1991 i think it was uh brooklyn 75 precinct which was a big precinct there were 2250 murders in new york city in 1991 and uh there were 250 murders just in the 75 precinct in one year so think about that if you're living in an area say you're living in brooklyn compare it like you're living in the 6-2 250 people were killed. That doesn't mean people who were stabbed, shot, batted out, that lived. Those are 250 confirmed kills. Wow. In the 7-5 at that time. 
So that was a rough precinct to work in. I give I take my hat off to all the cops that work there because that's a burnout place to work. It's job after job after job. And you talk about dangerous, you know, runs, you know, that it was it was uh it was crazy in the night. late eighties, early nineties, seven five was really a hard place for good good hard working people to live in, you know, it was a terrible thing for them. And it was very hard for the cops to, to keep order over there. And thank you very much for saying that about me. Yeah, you're a great guest. They they really love having you on. Uh Tommy, Jimmy, Jimmy the Gap, Tommy Dates killed it again. Thank Tommy, you. Tom, I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time, Mr. Dates. Tommy, please don't call me Mr. Dates. You make me feel older than I am. <laughs> And oh, Boston J is always. Thank you. Hey, Tom, hey, here's one left. Hey, Tommy, did you ever put cuffs on any Genovese guys? You know what? That's that's a great question. Whoever whoever uh, is writing that, Flatbush Brooklyn, um, you're smart because uh, I put I, I put cuffs on the Cavalcanti guys, Gambino guys, Colombo guys, Bonanno guys, uh, Lucchese guys. Never ever did I ever put handcuffs on a Genovese guy. Nor do I really know much about the, I mean, I know the basics. I really don't know much about the Genovese crime family. And, you know, I'm sure there are people. I do know some agents that are very up to par with it. But that has a lot to do with the way that family is run. And you really don't hear many guys, you know, many major takedowns from the Genovese family. You know what I'm saying? You really don't. And it's the way that family was run. It was run the way all the other families were supposed to be run. And if they all followed, the, you know, the way they ran it, the way, you know, it was founded by Vito Genovese and the Chin and Tony Solano and all those guys, those guys, all these guys probably still, still be out there. You know what I'm saying? So they were so, that's a family that's a, a major challenge to infiltrate, you know, never locked up a Genovese guy in my life. All right, Tom, I'm going to let you go. Listen, hey, I really appreciate you. Thanks for coming on. You know I love you. You know and, I love uh, you too. I got this guy over here. He says, you know, bring Tommy Dades on once a week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate everybody that watches. And, uh, you know, I really do. And uh, Jimmy's doing Jimmy's doing a great job on these YouTube channels. They're very interesting. Um you know, I had nothing against the chin. You know, he was, I think he was a very smart guy, to be honest with you. And I watched the interview with his daughter, Rita. And she seems like, a, you know, a very down-to-earth uh, lady. And uh, I enjoyed listening to her talk. I think it was very interesting with the chin because nobody ever got to really know what he was like as a human being, you know, like what kind of guy he was, you know. And she kind of broke it down, you know. Um, the family life with him and he was kind of a mystery and you know that's to his credit he made it very hard to for anybody to really uh nail him you know what i'm saying so uh my hat goes off to rita and i enjoyed the show watching her and it was very interesting i was very curious about the chin great guest jimmy all right tom well you're a great guest too and uh you know thanks again and i'll talk to you soon yes sir thank you jimmy Good thanks Good night. Good night. Tommy Dates, first grade detective. You know, Tommy Dates, too. You know, Tommy Dates could have went the wrong way in life. And, uh, but, you know, he went the right way. First grade detective. Now he's retired. And, uh, you know, he's inspiration to me. He helped me out with my life. And uh, I appreciate him very much. To all you guys out there that showed up today, thank you. Joey D, I see you. Family should write a book. Yes, absolutely. But uh, let me just uh, pull something out over here quick. One more time. The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed. It's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The 
the streets will never love you back. Thanks, guys. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for showing up. I love you guys. I'll see you again Wednesday. Tomorrow I'll be taking a break. Wednesday I'm going to have Phil and Bill from Police Off the Cuff. It's going to be a good one. And then I got another special guest coming up uh, maybe end of the week or sometime next week. But uh, I'm going to keep on working on my channel. I got some special people coming in. You're going to love them. And you guys are the best. I got the best followers in the world. Thank you, guys. I'll see you soon. Everybody, have a good night. Stay safe. Bye, guys.